Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class. We just have Kennedy join it from, uh, from the online students. Okay, all of them are joining. We'll just wait. In the meantime, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Anyone like to lead us in prayer? Kung, you like to pray? Yes. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. Thank you for the class that we are going to be listening to. I thank you that you would just uh, give us more revelation of your word and that uh, you would help um, Pastor to uh, uh, teach us accurately, God, and to um, uh, lead us uh, to know more about you, Jesus. Uh, thank you for helping us, for guiding us, and for uh, being there for us, God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Kung. Okay. We were looking at uh, studying Romans chapter 9. Okay, we came right up to verse 18. Uh, we were looking at um, the whole concept of uh, predestination, the whole thought of predestination. And uh, we learned that, you know, uh, God does not predestine or predetermine the choices that we make, but he knows beforehand the choices that we make. He has the foreknowledge, and to his foreknowledge, he knows the choices that he makes. And sometimes he reveals, uh, you know, the, the choices uh, that, you know, that certain people are going to make. But irrespective of uh, the choices that each one of us make, you know, God will can still unfold his plan and purposes that he has planned even before uh, the creation of the world. Okay. So God can still go ahead with his plan and purposes, irrespective of the choices that we make, even if our choices are not aligned or in will or in accordance with his plan and purpose, but yet he can still fulfill his plan and uh, purpose. And we saw the example of um, Pharaoh, okay, and uh, how God gave him up to his heart and heart. And uh, it, we saw that, you know, in scripture it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. We also read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, which does not mean that, you know, God really hardened his heart. The sense that, you know, um, since Pharaoh chose to harden his heart, you know, he just gave him up to his hardened heart. He let him make his own choice. He let him do what he wanted uh, to do. And, uh, you know, uh, thus it means that, you know, God hardened his heart. It does not really mean that he hardened his heart, but you know, he let him do whatever he chose. He let him cho choose to harden his heart against him, and God let him do it. And that's that's why what it means uh, when it says in Scripture that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. As Pharaoh had uh, the opportunity to choose, you know, uh, to whether to harden his heart or not, he chose to harden his heart. But it also became an opportunity for God to display his uh, greatness and his uh, power. Okay. And Paul, Apostle uh, Paul, builds on it further in verses 19 to 24. So, can somebody please read 19 to 24, please? Anyone? 19 to 24, can somebody can read it slowly and clearly for us? Read. No, did you unmute your mic? Your mic is not unmuted. Yeah, now it is. You say to me then, why does this, why does this still find God? For who can one minute. Are you able to hear Rasha? She's reading. Yes, no. 
the rest of you online students? Can we have some response, please? Are you able to hear Asha when she read? Okay, Abhishek says yes. Okay, continue, Asha. Well, who are you? Oh, man, to answer that, God. Well, what is my book say to me today? Why have you made me like this? As a father, not my daughter to come to make up of the same of God. Well, there's so many purple books, and I hear for the sun of the books. Why did God desire me to show his love and his sweetly? I don't think they're able to hear you because Kennedy is saying no. Do you want to put your headset on and check for yourself? Can you check now? Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? I don't think they're able to hear you. Okay, can somebody else read, please? Can I ask somebody of our own, one of our online students to please read Romans chapter 9, verses 19 to 24? Anyone? Ma'am. Romans chapter Yes, go ahead, Sister Rupa. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is model say to its modeler? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out the same lump, one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable, dishonorable use? What if God desiring to show his wrath, to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even as when he has called not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Ma'am, shall I proceed? Uh, till verse 24. Where? Okay. Till 26 I have read, ma'am. Okay, Sorry. no worries. Okay, thank you, Rupa. Okay, so here we see that Paul is developing his thought. Uh, and then he, uh, you know, he's asking another question in verse uh, 19. Um, now, these questions, basically, we know that he's asking, he's uh, thinking what his audience will ask. Okay, so basically what he thinks that his audience will ask, uh, he kind of mentions those questions, he writes those questions. So he says, uh, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Verse 19. So in the context, he's saying that, you know, uh, so if we say that, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then God cannot find fault with Pharaoh, right? Because it's God himself who hardened Pharaoh's heart. So if God was doing it to Pharaoh, then, you know, Pharaoh will have no choice. Uh, he cannot resist the will of uh, God. So this is an obvious question that people would ask if, if it was this way, uh, you know, that things happen. But um, he says that, you know, but indeed, oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing that formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? So Paul is basically uh, saying that, you know, when you ask a question like this, you're basically showing how disrespectful such a question is. And uh, he's saying that, you know, uh, uh, no, this question cannot even arise because we know that, um, you know, it was not God who makes the choice. It was Pharaoh's own choice. It was him who hardened his heart. And, uh, you know, he uses an... Um, just a minute, somebody has... Okay. He's used, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an example here of uh, a potter. 
Okay, uh, he's using a picture of a potter and he explains uh, this verse in the next verse using this, uh, you know, the picture of a potter. A potter from the same lump of clay, you know, he can divide that lump of clay into two portions. One lump he can create a vessel for an honorable purpose, like, you know, a nice showpiece that will look very grand or something that can be used, uh, you know, for special occasions. The other lump he can take and make something very simple about uh, from that, something very ordinary, uh, something like, uh, you know, something that we can just keep some waste things or, uh, you know, unuseful items uh, in that. Now, can the clay say, hey, you know, I want, I don't want to be made for honorable purpose uh, or I don't want to make, be made for a, 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 a uh, uh, a simple purpose. I want to be made for an honorable purpose. No, the clay has no sin. Okay, so in this sense, uh, you know, God is yes going to unfold His plans and purposes uh, to different individuals that He chooses in that sense. So He chooses some to make uh, for honorable purposes, and uh, you know, some to for Him to show His grandeur, His power, His glory. And some for, uh, you know, for dishonorable purposes, something for simple. So, for example, he used Moses uh, to show his glory, his might, and his power. And he used um, uh, Pharaoh to show his uh, downfall. No, but this does not mean that, uh, you know, uh, in, this, in, this, in this example that he's using, you know, of course, a lump of clay has no say, but, you know, um, unlike the lump of clay, you know, we human beings have a free will to choose. And hence, you know, Moses chose, you know, Moses chose to be in an honorable position and Pharaoh chose to be in a dishonorable uh, position. And so based on their choices, God used one for an honorable use and based on the other's choice, he used the other for a dishonorable uh, uh, Purpose. Okay, so it's not that God is predetermining or predestining who has to be uh, doing honorable things and who has to be doing dishonorable things, but His purpose is one and the same for everybody. We know that He has His plans and purposes for us are good, pleasing, and perfect uh, plans and purposes uh, that will you know give us a hope and a good future. Um, but you know, knowing this about God, yet, you know, uh, if we choose uh, to go against God's will and plan and purpose, then we end up being destined according to what our choices are. So if we choose for to do God's will and uh, plan and purpose, then we're destined to do, you know, uh, things that are honorable, that bring glory and honor to God, to whom, to us, to whom his glory is being uh, manifested. So here there is a very interesting intersection or an interplay of God's uh, predetermined uh, plan and man's free will to uh, choose. So for Pharaoh, you know, God already had a purpose uh, that he's going to be the leader, okay, of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh is going to be the leader of Egypt. Moses is going to be a leader through whom God is going to, you know, deliver his people out of uh, bondage, out of slavery. So here we see that uh, two leaders, um, uh, but two of them making different choices. One choosing to be a leader, even though he was very hesitant, but now he's got into the shoes of being a leader. He uh, He's doing what God is asking him to do. The other one is hardening his heart. He's uh, a leader, but he's hardening his heart. He doesn't want to uh, submit, surrender to the God of the Israelites. And uh, so here we see that, you know, God is displaying his power and glory and mighty works to the one that made the right choice, that is Moses. And he's uh, showing his... Uh, you know, the, on the other hand, Pharaoh, who's making the wrong choice, who's hardening his heart, is on the other receiving end of God's wrath and his judgment uh, and, uh, you know, no mercy and compassion from God because it's his choice. It's not that God has chosen some, uh, chosen Pharaoh to bring about his wrath and judgment and he's chosen Moses to bring uh, about his glory. No, when we say that, it is saying that God is partial and no way God is partial. But here it's, you know, uh, on the choices that 
uh, each one chooses, God is bringing about or unveiling or un or revealing his plan and purposes. He's bringing about his plan and purposes that he's already predetermined in his uh, mind so here we see that god is using moses to display his power and might so his and he's using his uh, pharaoh to reveal his glory his power and might so that throughout the nations you know uh, god's fame would be known and god would uh, go about doing his plan and purpose of delivering his uh, people so this was god's plan and no one could stop it no one even pharaoh whether he hardens his heart or not you know, uh, he, he cannot stop God's plan and purpose. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, uh, it does not do away, God does not do away with the free will and the choice of either Moses or Pharaoh, but irrespective of whatever the choices was, you know, Pharaoh's choice was, his Moses' choice was, God still went ahead, fulfilled his plan, delivered his people uh, as he had spoken uh, and promised to uh, Abraham. So we see that the more Pharaoh hardened his heart, the more it gave opportunity for the power of God to be displayed and the fame of God uh, to be known uh, throughout uh, Egypt and throughout the nations surrounding uh, Egypt because God had already purposed in his heart to deliver his people and his plan was being unfolded. So the election of God was there. The foreknowledge and the predetermining will of his plan was at work, but yet Pharaoh had his own choice uh, whether to harden his heart or not. So here in this, uh, uh, this is the analogy of the potter and clay, and uh, there is a difference between the clay, which has no say, uh, but you know we as human beings, uh, we have a say, we have a choice, we have a free moral will to choose, and based on our choices, you know, it predetermines whether the plan of God and purpose of God will come true in our lives or whether we'll be on the receiving end of God's wrath or his um, judgment. So what Paul is saying in verse 21 is there are vessels for honor and vessels for dishonor. Uh, he's making a comparison between two vessels, vessels of honor and vessels for dishonor. In verse 22, he's talking again, he's making a comparison of vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. And so here when he's talking about vessels, he's basically referring to uh, people. So people uh, end up receiving God's judgment or people end up receiving his uh, mercy. Okay. Um, uh, and, you know, as creation of God, um, you know, uh, we are, you know, on either one of the other ends. We're either the end, one end of receiving uh, or manifesting God's uh, glory, uh, receiving his mercy, or we, we are on the other end where we are receiving his uh, wrath and uh, destruction. Okay. So, uh, and we see that God planned that there would be a judgment where, you know, people will receive his wrath, his destruction for those who do not receive him. Uh, but it's not that, you know, when people don't receive him and uh, they go against him, he's not saying, OK, you know, this is what I said. Uh, you do not receive me. You do not believe in me. So here, this is, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're at the receiving end of my wrath, my judgment. So take my wrath and my judgment. No, it's, he's not a God like that. He's, but it says here in verse 22 that God endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Okay, so uh, who endured? with much long suffering. Here is talking about God. So God endured with much long suffering, the vessels of God prepared for destruction. So why did he endure? Why did God endure with long suffering? If there were already vessels who predetermined their own destruction because you know they, they had made their own choices and their choices led them to their own destruction. So why does God have to endure with these vessels of uh, of uh, wrath that uh, you know prepared for destruction why does he endure with long suffering the fact that god uh, you know uh, uh, was enduring with much long suffering is because he's waiting for these people to repent he's waiting for these people to repent but when they did not 
uh, repent even after God was waiting patiently for them to repent, you know, uh, the only uh, judgment for them is, uh, you know, is destruction. So here we don't see that, you know, you make a choice and God says, here, okay, you know, you've gone again, my will, my purpose, you got to see me. So here, this is the rod, this is your judgment, take it, you know, be destroyed. No, but we know that God is a gracious and compassionate and merciful God, a God who's slow to anger, God is abounding in love. So here also we see that, you know, he endures with long suffering. That means he puts up with a lot of patience, uh, though it's a suffering and a pain for him to see us in sin, going away from God, but he endures uh, with the rest vessels or with the people who uh, are going against him, defying him. Uh, but ultimately, when they choose and there is no more waiting time, their judgment is a uh, destruction. Okay, so but each vessel experiences God's enduring mercy. The long suffering of God and God is extremely patient with each person. If they still, you know, don't receive His mercy, they end up receiving what is for those who reject Him, and that is destruction. Okay, so God did not determine their choices uh, that they will make, but God determined the judgment. Okay, similarly, those who receive His mercy. Uh, God already determined their judgment. And what is their judgment? They would experience his glory, like we read in verse 23. Verse 23 says that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Okay, so those who uh, receive God's mercy, they are on the receiving end of uh, his judgment, that is his judgment of experiencing his glory, the riches of his glory, which he has prepared beforehand. So here we see that there is a sovereignty of God and the free will of man, and both come together. Okay, so the sovereignty of God, God does what he wills, he plans, he chooses, and yet, on the other hand, there is the free will of man, and we see both of them coming here to uh, Together. How do we see both of this coming here together? Is we see that uh, you know uh, Moses made the choice of being the leader of obeying God, and we see the sovereignty of God that God's plan and purposes is being fulfilled through Moses uh, to lead the people to bring them out of Egypt, and uh, you know uh, Moses is experiencing uh, the riches of God's glory. On the other hand, we see Pharaoh. Is an example. Uh, and here also again we see the sovereignty of God and we see the free will of man to choose. So here we see the free will of uh, Pharaoh, he chose to be hard-hearted and stubborn. And we see the sovereignty of God that in spite of Pharaoh's hard-heartedness and his stubbornness, we just still see that God goes ahead with his plan and his purpose. He does what his sovereign um, will is so also uh, the example that Paul mentioned that we saw on Wednesday, um, uh, Jacob and Esau. Okay, there is a sovereignty of God. Okay, God uh, continues to bring about the blessing from one generation to other generation through the firstborn male in each family. So it was Esau, but Esau made his choice. Okay. Um, the choice was that he did not want his birthright. He you know, gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. And it was Jacob who craved for that spiritual blessing. And we see that it is, you know, based on the choices, but God still fulfills his sovereign will of continuing the blessings from Abraham, Isaac. It's passed on to the next generation, that is chief Jacob. Not because um, he loved Jacob and hated Esau, but he loved Jacob for the spiritual choice that he made for choosing God. And he hated Esau's choice of just forfeiting his spiritual inheritance of thinking of it as an unworthy uh, thing and just sold it for a bowl of uh, soup. So here we see, you know, the sovereignty of God, the free will of man in every instance coming together. So even in our lives, there is the sovereignty of God. He has a plan and purpose for our lives, but we choose otherwise. 
you know, God can still use others to bring about his plan and purpose. He will still go ahead, bring about his plan and purpose, irrespective of the choices that we uh, make. So ultimately, God's purpose is still fulfilled, you know, while still man goes ahead and makes his free will and his uh, choice. And this is an amazing, you know, work, uh, or the amazing working of God's uh, purpose, uh, uh, of how he fulfills his plan and purpose in history through people, irrespective of the choices that they make. Okay. So Mangi has a question. Uh, what about when God said he chose Jacob because before he was born? Yes, like Mangi, uh, I'm not sure if you were there in the in the class on Wednesday, but uh, we, we said that, you know, this was God's, he says this as this God's foreknowledge. He already knew what uh, Esau is going to choose and what Jacob is going to choose. He already knew, foreknew. It's not that he predestined, okay? It's not that he predestined Esau to give away his birthright and for Jacob to choose the birthright because uh, it's not because God loved Jacob more than he loved Esau. No, it's, when we say that, we're saying God is partial. He can't be partial. He loves everybody. He's a God of love. We can't hate one and love the other. Um, and so in that instance, when, when we look at it, how do we interpret it in the light of other scripture? We, we interpret it that, you know, God actually foreknew uh, the plans and uh, the plans and the purposes or the, sorry, he foreknew the choices that each one of them are going to make. He foreknew what uh, Esau was going to choose, and he also knew what uh, Jacob was going to uh, choose. And here, through his foreknowledge, he's just basically revealing before time what each one of them are going to be making their choices of. So this is his foreknowledge that he is actually sharing here, but it's not his predetermined choice that God is making for both of them. No, he already knows the choice and it's just his foreknowledge is revealing it beforehand. Did that help, Mangi? Uh, yes, yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay so we'll continue. Uh, verse uh, 24, it says, even us whom he called not on, not of the Jews only, but also of the uh, Gentiles. Now Paul is saying that everything that he has said uh, so far is not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Okay, God's sovereign purpose uh, is at work not only among the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And his sovereign purpose is being worked out, is being fulfilled for all those who say yes to God. And all those who say yes to God are those uh, whom he has called. So he's going back to what, you know, Paul, Paul is going back to what he has been explaining, that God's purpose of what he has spoken uh, to the Israelites is not void. Remember in, uh, in, in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, uh, we said is, you know, is all the, uh, the, the, the promises that God made, the covenants he gave, the laws he gave, uh, you know, the, the forefathers was for the Jews, uh, the priesthood came from the Jews. Now, you know, he's, he's forgotten about the Jews, so to say, in people's um, minds because he's chosen the church because the church is uh, whom he's transforming to be the image of his son to be like his son Jesus Christ so he's saying uh, you know in this light are uh, we saying that all the promises the covenants and everything that the laws that God gave the Jews is a void does it does it mean that it's no more of any use it's it's baseless it's it it stands uh, it does not stand anymore so you know um, uh, Paul is saying, no, no, it does stand. And he's speaking of uh, the children of promise. And remember, he says in the first few verses, it's not uh, the children of promise are not those who are the natural inheritance or natural born of the Jews. But he's saying these children of promise that he, the, uh, that he makes to Abraham and to Sarah and to Isaac, the children of promise are not the ones who are born 
in the lineage of Jews or to Jewish parents, but these children of promise are those who are becoming uh, children by faith. You know, by faith they receive righteousness, by faith they say yes to God, uh, by faith they receive uh, the, uh, the, the inheritance of being uh, the promise has of receiving the promises that God made to uh, Abraham, okay, and to Isaac. So, um, you know, he's saying, you, you know, it's all the promises that God made to the Jews is not void, but he was speaking of those of the promise and he was speaking of his predetermined purpose that God uh, would fulfill all that would take place in both the Jews and Gentiles uh, and to everyone who say yes to God's call or to receiving God's mercy or in the receiving end of his mercy and his uh, grace. So he's put both of these together side by side. So what God was speaking to Abraham he was not speaking to the natural children, children, but to the children of promise. And his uh, purpose is being fulfilled in both the Jews and Gentiles who say yes to him, who receive his mercy, uh, who believe in him uh, by faith. So the next set of verses that we will be reading, Paul shows from the Old Testament scripture that God had already planned and purposed to bring the Gentiles in. And God's plan and purpose was not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles that he quotes from Hosea, uh, from the prophet Hosea and from uh, the prophet uh, Isaiah. So can somebody read verses uh, 25 to 29, please? Anyone can read 25 to 29, please? Yes, sir, Pastor. As he saith also in OC, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, where shall they be called the children of the living God? Yes, yes, I ask also crieth concerning Israel, though the numbers of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut, in, cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and been made like unto Gomorrah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sri Kumar. Okay, Thank so Paul is quoting here from both Hosea, the prophet Hosea and Isaiah, from the book of Hosea and Isaiah. He's quoting from Hosea chapter 25 and uh, sorry, from uh, he's quoting about Hosea in verses 25 and 26. Uh, God has already spoken that those who are not called as my people, God says, I will call them my people. And he's referring to the Gentiles. You know, the chosen people whom God called as his own and his own people, uh, we know are the Jews. But God here is saying, those who are not called as my people, I will call them my people. And he's referring to the Gentiles uh, to show that God, uh, and why is Paul quoting Hosea here is to show that God had already purposed or predetermined in his heart, it was a sovereign will that the Gentiles would be called his people and they would uh, be called his beloved and they would be his sons and uh, daughters. They would be the sons and daughters of the Most High God. So just as he had spoken ahead of time about Jacob and Esau, just as he had spoken ahead of time um, that he would set his people free from Egypt, the same way he's spoken ahead of time that the Gentiles would also be ones that he would call um, and, uh, you know, his own people and they would be his sons and uh, daughters. And he says at the same time concerning his own people, you know, uh, Jews, Paul quotes from Isaiah, uh, the thought that, uh, you know, uh, though the number of the children of Israel be as a sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. And verse 28 says, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the uh, earth. 
Okay, so it says here that though the number of the children of Israel be as a sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. So it says, though the numerous Jews and you know, innumerable, countless, uh, and many of them have not accepted God, have not accepted Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah who was to come, they have not accepted the plan and the purpose and, uh, of God. Uh, through Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross, yet there is a remnant, there are few Jews, you know, uh, who made this choice and, uh, you know, who are saved, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, these people, God has called them to himself because not that he loves a few Jews and not the others, but it's because these people have made that uh, choice. And he says that, uh, you know, thank Thank God that not all of them are being destroyed like Sodom and uh, Gomorrah. So there are a lot of Jews who have not accepted Christ, uh, but there is a few remnant who have accepted. And these, you know, God has called them as his own, as his own people. Um, and he has justified them. Those he has called, he has justified them and he has made them uh, righteous. Now to understand this uh, whole um, phrase, uh, you know, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make short work upon the earth. Now, just reading from uh, the, uh, the Passion Translation, it says, For the Lord will act and carry out his word on the earth and waste no time to accomplish it. So God is irrespective of whether the Jews choose them or not. Yes, there are people, a few of them, who's, you know, a remnant of them who've chosen him. And, you know, God is still going to continue, uh, you know, to fulfill his sovereign will and purpose and plan of the other Jews to come into faith and also the Gentiles be grafted into the tree of life, grafted into, uh, you know, the promises that God had made to Abraham. So here he is presenting two con contrasting thoughts. One is the Gentiles, you know, um, Paul is saying they never thought God had anything for the Gentiles, but actually, you know, he had already predestined, he had already planned and spoken that they too will be his sons and uh, daughters. And then on the other side, we have his own people, the Jews, the Israelites. God had actually, you know, had to do a rescue act um, to rescue some of them, to cut short his work so that some of them can be saved and be with him and not all of them will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. So what Paul is saying here is God has already spoken about it through the prophets earlier. It's revealed in the Old Testament to the prophets and uh, God's purposes are being fulfilled. We can see it being fulfilled and will continue to be um, fulfilled. So then what is the conclusion? Uh, Paul is coming to say, okay, what is the conclusion now? So what is happening to the Jews? So that's what he mentions, uh, the conclusion and what is happening to Jews in verses 30 to 33. So can one of you please read um, Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 33, please. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but but as it is were by the work of the law, for they stumbled at the stone, at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion and stumbling stone and rock of offense and whoever believes on me whoever believes on him will not be put to sin thank you abinas so here uh, you know uh, paul is coming to a conclusion again he is uh, asking a question he's saying what shall we say then uh, that the gentiles did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness even the righteousness of of faith. So he's saying here that the Gentiles, they have uh, received their righteousness, they have a right standing of grace uh, through faith, is because of 
their faith in God because they've chosen uh, to put their faith in God. And because they've chosen to put their faith in God, they have a right standing of grace uh, through faith. And the Jews, you know, who had the promises, who had the covenants, uh, uh, you know, who had the law, they had they, they had the forefathers, um, and they had, from them had they had the priesthood uh, that came out, the lineage of priests and everybody, uh, you know. So instead of receiving uh, by faith, uh, you know, they're still holding on to the the law, you know, to fulfilling the law, to keeping the law, and the covenant of uh, circumcision. And so Paul is saying that they cannot, and they uh, they cannot, you know, come to faith uh, by just keeping the law and by uh, the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. They cannot come to faith, and uh, hence, uh, because they continue to keep the law and you know the circumcision ritual what is the result of it the result is they are actually you know they are stumbling over christ okay we know that it is uh, written that you know christ is the cornerstone he's the chief cornerstone uh, and it's written behold i lay in zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense and whoever believes on him will not be put to uh, shame so you know christ is the stone and he's the rock and, uh, you know, he's saying that, you know, by overlooking him, they're actually stumbling over Christ because they want to keep the law. They can't keep the law. You know, they want to uh, fulfill the, 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 the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. And that is not going to make them any way righteous. They're not going to have a right standing uh, by grace because it's not through the law. It's not through the circumcision, but it's through faith. And because of that, you know, they are stumbling over Christ. They are overlooking what Christ has done. Uh, they're not seeing the significance of Christ. And hence, they're missing out that he is the Messiah who came to uh, set them free from uh, sin and uh, the dominion of sin and the power of um, sin. Okay. So that is how he ends. And he's, you know, Paul is basically in this chapter saying, you know, yes, uh, you know, I, I love my people and I have a burden for them. Uh, he says, you know, in the, uh, in the first few chapters, he says, you know, verse 2, he says, you know, I have great sorrow and continual grief for them. And he says, I wish I could even go to heaven, uh, you know, if my people, you know, they accept and they believe uh, in uh, Jesus Christ. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. And he, he says, you know, yes, my people have... Uh, the chosen people, they're the sons and daughters of God. You know, to them, God gave them the promises, the covenants, the laws. Uh, uh, they had uh, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, to them also came the, uh, you know, the priesthood. But, you know, uh, you know, but, you know, we see that uh, the promise that God was actually speaking was not uh, through the natural generation to the not to the natural born descendants but the seeds of promise and he says you know the seeds of promise here is not those who are born uh, to jewish race or to jewish parents but the seeds of faith seeds of promise are those people who receive uh, god by uh, faith and once they receive god by faith you know, uh, they become vessels of honor, they become vessels of his mercy, where they're experiencing his glory. But, you know, if they, you know, even after or enduring through long suffering, patiently waiting for them, even after that, if they don't receive him, uh, they harden their hearts, they don't believe in him, they don't put faith in him then they come to the receiving end of God's judgment, that is his um, wrath. But God is patient, he's uh, patiently waiting on them. And he says that, you know, um, actually what God was, you know, showing to the prophets in the Old Testament is that, uh, you know, the promise uh, is of, uh, uh, you know, of blessing is for both for the Jews and Gentiles, and it's not only for the uh, Jewish race. And he says that, you know, God is not partial. Uh, he's not choosing people based on partiality, but he's choosing them based on their 
uh, choices. Based on that ch choices, predetermines what is their uh, judgment or what is their end result. So they call upon it themselves based on their uh, choices. So God has his sovereign will. He does what he wills. Uh, but at the same time, man has his uh, the free will to choose. Yes, Mandy. Thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a the topic is a little bit challenging uh, because we read that in the gift of of uh, the gift of Holy Spirit and calling, God gives to the whosoever He wills. So, how can we uh, reconcile? Uh, him choosing us based on our choices that we're going to make and based on, on and the scripture we read that he chooses, he gives gift, gifts to whosoever he wills so that uh, his, his church might be glorified and his kingdom might go forward. Thank you, Pastor. Good question. Thank you, Mangi. Uh, we always need to interpret scripture in the light of other scripture. So even in that context, when he says that, you know, God gives gives to those he wills, the Holy Spirit gives uh, to gives to those who will and chooses, it's not that he does not give all of the nine gifts to everyone who desires. You know, he gives uh, it to everybody who's, you know, who have faith in Christ Jesus and uh, who is born of him. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in them. And uh, when we uh, desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we receive all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. But in the context that is written, it says, you know, God, the Holy Spirit desires which gifts to give is in that context, you know, the Holy Spirit will know which is the best gifts to be released in that time for that situation to help that person. So, for example, um, if a person is sick with cancer, then, you know, uh, the person, uh, the what is the best gift at that time? It's not just prophecy, a word of word, wisdom or knowledge, but uh, uh, yes, all that is important, but it is the working of a miracle, okay? So that is the gift that will be activated at that time. So the Holy Spirit knows which of the nine gifts, uh, among the nine gifts, which is the most important gift that needs to be activated at that time for that person in that situation to bring about, uh, you know, the glory of God to be revealed or bring about uh, uh, the miracle or the sign and wonder that has happened. So in all instances, you know, all the nine gifts don't operate. You know, there are few that gifts that are important, but the Holy Spirit chooses which gift to give to that person to release through, say, your mind, you're praying for somebody else, you know, uh, they come to you with um, a problem, uh, uh, a distressing problem. So what you need at that time is a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge to know what is their situation, what is their future, or even a word of prophecy to encourage them and strengthen them. So the so Holy Spirit will release the appropriate uh, gifts among the nine gifts of the Spirit appropriate gift at that situation to be released in and through you so that you can minister to that person but that person will experience uh you know uh, the answer or the presence of god the love of god and uh the will see the glory of god so that is the context that it's written that you know the holy spirit will release uh the specific the gifts at that time so we need to always interpret scripture in the light of other scripture. So all of the nine gifts is given to everybody, to all of them who ask. But in a specific situation, what is a gift that is required? The Holy Spirit will release it at that time in and through us. It's not that the other gifts are not uh, functioning. It's functioning. What is important at that time will be released. I hope that answered your question, Mangi. Uh, yes, yes, Pastor, answer. And I um, know I'm, I'm, I'm asking so many questions. No and worries. The calling, the calling of God. Yes. Because, for example, uh, Paul, Paul was called specific to by God to preach. Uh, John the John the Baptist, uh, John, was called, and his father was told that the child should not touch alcohol or do other things. What about those people, Pastor? Thank you. Uh, yeah, good question again. Uh, again, here we know that the New Testament that, you know, there are specific offices 
of a possible prophet teacher, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, God calls us into, that is determined by God, by the Holy Spirit, yes, and is given to a few. Uh, that does not mean that, again, it's uh, based on uh, partiality, but we know that God's word says that God is not a partial God. It's also uh, God knows beforehand who is going to use that gift, that anointing, uh, in the in the right way they're going there he already knows that they are vessels that have chosen themselves to be vessels of honor and not for you know just for ordinary simple use so these people he already knows that you know um, these people are already preparing themselves to be that vessels of honor and uh, not simple people so it's not that god is uh, you know, uh, making a, a, a biased choice, but he already knows who is going to uh, be fitting for which role and the choices that they have already made, which we can't see, you know, how they're preparing themselves, how they're training themselves, how they're desiring themselves, their walk with the Lord, their intimacy with the Lord. And, you know, God, uh, you know, pours out his anointing upon him he does not pour his anointing upon vessels that are broken because he knows that broken vessels will waste away uh the anointing so you know uh of course god's uh, you know plan and purpose is uh fulfilled in and through us but we need to cooperate with god okay the, the extent we cooperate with god is the extent uh that you know we will flow with his anointing with his power with his authority and to the extent that uh, he uh, takes us to okay so when he chooses whether he chooses uh, david compared to his other brothers or joseph compared to his other brothers we can also see from scripture why god made those choices because you can see the attitude of uh, the brothers you know david's brothers you see his uh, their attitude just looking at scripture one or two verses that talks about their attitude even joseph's brothers but you see joseph's uh, attitude so you know it was already that god knows the predetermined choices that they're going to make and hence he already knows who's going to be vessels of honor and who's going to be vessels uh who are going to be simple it's not that he chose that but it's according to what we choose we want to be choose uh, we chose to be vessels of honor we become that we want to be simple you know we we get uh, some, because God does not override the free will of man or the choices that they make. Does that help, Mangi? But all of us are called. Yes. But it also depends on us, how we partner with uh, God. Even we see that Jesus, even though he was human, he partnered with God, right? He was constantly in tune with his father here. That's why he said, I'll always say what my father says. I always do what my father does. Even when he goes to the pool of Bethesda, there were so many sick people. He healed everyone, but he heals only one. Why? Because that's what his father showed him, told him. He just did that. So the greater level of anointing flew. He, he had a, a, a anointing beyond measure, the power of the Holy Spirit beyond measure, because that is how you know, Jesus brought himself to that position. And it's important that we do that. And when we do that, you know, God pours out his anointing and his power because he knows that will not be wasted. We know that we will, we will do what he uh, requires of us. Okay. Yes, Mangi, you have another question. You raised up your hand. Oh, that's what's oh, Sorry, but, uh, sorry it was for his text. Sorry. Thank you very much okay. for, for answering Okay, thank you, Mangi. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, uh, if there's no questions, then uh, we'll end class here. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Have a blessed and a refreshing weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.